Story 1. Recording by Beth Thomas. Household Tales by Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Story 1. The Frog King, or Iron Henry. In old times, when wishing still helped one, there lived a king whose daughters were all beautiful, but the youngest was so beautiful that the sun itself, which has seen so much, was astonished whenever it shone in her face. Close by the king's castle lay a great dark forest, and under an old lime tree in the forest was a well. And when the day was very warm, the king's child went out into the forest and sat down by the side of the cool fountain, and when she was dull, she took a golden ball and threw it up on high and caught it. And this ball was her favourite plaything. Now, it so happened that on one occasion, the princess's golden ball did not fall into the little hand which she was holding up for it, but onto the ground beyond and rolled straight into the water. The king's daughter followed it with her eyes, but it vanished, and the well was deep, so deep that the bottom could not be seen. On this she began to cry, and cried louder and louder and could not be comforted. And, as she thus lamented, someone said to her, What ails thee, king's daughter? Thou weepest so that even a stone would show pity. She looked round to the side from whence the voice came, and saw a frog stretching forth its thick, ugly head from the water. Ah, old water splasher, is it thou? said she. I am weeping for my golden ball which has fallen into the well. Be quiet and do not weep, answered the frog. I can help thee, but what wilt thou give me if I bring thy plaything up again? Whatever thou wilt have, dear frog, said she, my clothes, my pearls, and jewels, and even the golden crown which I am wearing. The frog answered, I do not care for thy clothes, thy pearls and jewels, or thy golden crown. But if thou wilt love me, and let me be thy companion and playfellow, and sit by thee at thy little table, and eat off thy little golden plate, and drink out of thy little cup, and sleep in thy little bed, if thou wilt promise me this, I will go down below, and bring thee thy golden ball up again. Oh, yes, said she, I promise thee all thou wishest, if thou wilt but bring me my ball back again. She, however, thought, how the silly frog does talk. He lives in the water with the other frogs and croaks and can be no companion to any human being. But the frog, when he had received this promise, put his head into the water and sank down, and in a short while came swimming up again with the ball in his mouth and threw it on the grass. The king's daughter was delighted to see her pretty plaything once more and picked it up and ran away with it. Wait, wait, said the frog, Take me with thee, I can't run as thou canst. But what did it avail him to scream his croak croak after her as loudly as he could? She did not listen to it, but ran home, and soon forgot the poor frog, who was forced to go back into his well again. The next day, when she had seated herself at table with the king and all the courtiers, and was eating from her little golden plate, something came creeping, splish splash, splish splash, up the marble staircase. And when it had got to the top, it knocked at the door and cried, Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. She ran to see who was outside, but when she opened the door, there sat the frog in front of it. Then she slammed the door too, in great haste, sat down to dinner again, and was quite frightened. The king saw plainly that her heart was beating violently, and he said, My child, what art thou so afraid of? Is there perchance a giant outside who wants to carry thee away? Oh no, replied she, it is no giant, but a disgusting frog. What does a frog want with thee? Oh, dear father, yesterday as I was in the forest sitting by the well playing, my golden ball fell into the water. And because I cried so, the frog brought it out again for me. And because he so insisted, I promised him he should be my companion. But I never thought he would be able to come out of his water. And now he is outside there and wants to come into me. In the meantime, it knocked a second time and cried, Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Dost thou not know what thou saidst to me yesterday by the cool waters of the fountain? Princess, youngest princess, Open the door for me. Then said the king, That which thou hast promised thou must perform. 
go and let him in. She went and opened the door, and the frog hopped in and followed her step by step to her chair. There he sat and cried, Lift me up beside thee. She delayed, until at last the king commanded her to do it. When the frog was once on the chair, he wanted to be on the table. And when he was on the table, he said, Now, push thy little golden plate nearer to me, so that we may eat together. She did this, but it was easy to see that she did not do it willingly. The frog enjoyed what he ate, but almost every mouthful she took choked her. At length he said, I have eaten and am satisfied, now I am tired. Carry me into thy little room, and make thy little silken bed ready, and we will both lie down and go to sleep. The king's daughter began to cry, for she was afraid of the cold frog, which she did not like to touch, and which was now to sleep in her pretty clean little bed. But the king grew angry and said, He who helped thee when thou wert in trouble ought not afterwards to be despised by thee. So she took hold of the frog with two fingers, carried him upstairs, and put him in a corner. But when she was in bed, he crept to her and said, I'm tired, I want to sleep as well as thou. Lift me up, or I will tell thy father. Then she was terribly angry, and took him up, and threw him with all her might against the wall. Now thou wilt be quiet, odious frog, said she. But when he fell down, he was no frog, but a king's son with beautiful kind eyes. He, by her father's will, was now her dear companion and husband. Then he told her how he had been bewitched by a wicked witch, and how no one could have delivered him from the well but herself, and that tomorrow they would go together into his kingdom. Then they went to sleep, and next morning when the sun awoke them, a carriage came driving up with eight white horses, which had white ostrich feathers on their heads, and were harnessed with golden chains and behind stood the young king's servant, Faithful Henry. Faithful Henry had been so unhappy when his master was changed into a frog that he had caused three iron bands to be laid round his heart, lest it should burst with grief and sadness. The carriage was to conduct the young king into his kingdom. Faithful Henry helped them both in, and placed himself behind again, and was full of joy because of this deliverance. And when they had driven a part of the way, the king's son heard a cracking behind him, as if something had broken. So he turned round and cried, Henry, the carriage is breaking. No, master, it is not the carriage, it is a band from my heart, which was put there in my great pain when you were a frog and imprisoned in the well. Again and once again, while they were on their way, something cracked, and each time the king's son thought the carriage was breaking, but it was only the bands which were springing from the heart of faithful Henry, because his master was set free and was happy. End of story one. Story two, recording by Peter Yearsley. Household Tales by Jakub and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Cat and Mouse in Partnership. A certain cat had made the acquaintance of a mouse, and had said so much to her about the great love and friendship she felt for her, that at length the mouse agreed that they should live and keep house together. But we must make a provision for winter, or else we shall suffer from hunger, said the cat. And you, little mouse, cannot venture everywhere, or you will be caught in a trap some day. The good advice was followed, and a pot of fat was bought, but they did not know where to put it. At length, after much consideration, the cat said, I know no place where it will be better stored up than in the church, for no one dares take anything away from there. We will set it beneath the altar, and not touch it until we are really in need of it. So the pot was placed in safety. But it was not long before the cat had a great yearning for it, and said to the mouse, I want to tell you something, little mouse. My cousin has brought a little son into the world, and has asked me to be godmother. He is white with brown spots, and I am to hold him over the font at the christening. Let me go out today, and you look after the house by yourself. Yes, yes, answered the mouse. By all means, go, and if you get anything very good, think of me. 
I should like a drop of sweet red christening wine, too. All this, however, was untrue. The cat had no cousin and had not been asked to be godmother. She went straight to the church, stole to the pot of fat, began to lick at it, and licked the top of the fat off. Then she took a walk upon the roofs of the town, looked out for opportunities, and then stretched herself in the sun, and licked her lips whenever she thought of the pot of fat, and not until it was evening did she return home. "'Well, here you are again,' said the mouse. "'No doubt you have had a merry day.' "'All went off well,' answered the cat. "'What name did they give the child?' "'Top off,' said the cat quite coolly. "'Top off?' cried the mouse. "'That is a very odd and uncommon name. "'Is it a usual one in your family?' "'What does it signify?' said the cat. "'It is no worse than crumb-stealer, as your godchildren are called.' Before long, the cat was seized by another fit of longing. She said to the mouse, "'You must do me a favour and once more manage the house for a day alone. "'I am again asked to be godmother, and as the child has a white ring round its neck, "'I cannot refuse.' The good mouse consented but the cat crept behind the town walls to the church and devoured half the pot of fat. Nothing ever seems so good as what one keeps to oneself, said she, and was quite satisfied with her day's work. When she went home, the mouse inquired, And what was this child christened? Half done, answered the cat. Half done? What are you saying? I never heard the name in my life. I'll wager anything it is not in the calendar. The cat's mouth soon began to water for some more licking. All good things go in threes, said she. I am asked to stand godmother again. The child is quite black, only it has white paws. But with that exception, it has not a single white hair on its whole body. This only happens once every few years. You will let me go, won't you? Top off? Half done, answered the mouse. They are such odd names. They make me very thoughtful. You sit at home, said the cat, in your dark grey fur coat and long tail, and are filled with fancies. That's because you do not go out in the daytime. During the cat's absence, the mouse cleaned the house and put it in order, but the greedy cat entirely emptied the pot of fat. When everything is eaten up, one has some peace, said she to herself, and, well filled and fat, she did not return home till night. The mouse at once asked what name had been given to the third child. It will not please you more than the others, said the cat. He is called All Gone. All Gone? cried the mouse. That is the most suspicious name of all. I have never seen it in print. All gone. What can that mean? And she shook her head, curled herself up, and lay down to sleep. From this time forth, no one invited the cat to be godmother. But when the winter had come, and there was no longer anything to be found outside, the mouse thought of their provision, and said, Come, cat, we will go to our pot of fat which we have stored up for ourselves. We shall enjoy that. Yes, answered the cat, you will enjoy it as much as you would enjoy sticking that dainty tongue of yours out of the window. They set out on their way, but when they arrived, the pot of fat certainly was still in its place, but it was empty. Alas, said the mouse, now I see what has happened, now it comes to light, you are a true friend, you have devoured all when you are standing godmother, first top off, then half done. Then will you hold your tongue, cried the cat. One word more, and I will eat you too. All gone was already on the poor mouse's lips. Scarcely had she spoken it, before the cat sprang on her, seized her, and swallowed her down. Verily, that is the way of the world. End of story two. Story number three of Household Tales. Household Tales by 
Jacob and Willem Grimm, translated by Margaret Hunt. Our Lady's Child. Hard by a great forest dwelt a woodcutter with his wife, who had only one child, a little girl three years old. They were so poor, however, that they no longer had daily bread and did not know how to get food for her. One morning the woodcutter went out sorrowfully to his work in the forest, and while he was cutting wood, suddenly there stood before him a tall and beautiful woman, with a crown of shining stars on her head, who said to him, I am the Virgin Mary, mother of the child Jesus. Thou art poor and needy. Bring thy child to me. I will take her with me and be her mother and care for her. The woodcutter obeyed, brought his child, and gave her to the Virgin Mary, who took her up to heaven with her. There the child fared well, ate sugar cakes, and drank sweet milk, and her clothes were of gold, and the little angels played with her. And when she was fourteen years of age, the Virgin Mary called her one day and said, Dear child, I am about to make a long journey, so take into thy keeping the keys of the thirteen doors of heaven. Twelve of these thou mayest open, and behold the glory which is within them. But the thirteenth, to which this little key belongs, is forbidden thee. Beware of opening it, or thou wilt bring misery on thyself. The girl promised to be obedient, and when the Virgin Mary was gone, she began to examine the dwellings of the kingdom of heaven. Each day she opened one of them, until she had made the round of twelve, in each of them sat one of the apostles in the midst of a great light, and she rejoiced in all the magnificence and splendor, and the little angels who always accompanied her rejoiced with her. Then the forbidden door alone remained, and she felt a great desire to know what could be hidden behind it, and said to the angels, I will not quite open it, and I will not go inside it, but I will unlock it so that we can see just a little through the opening. Oh no, said the little angels, that would be a sin. The Virgin Mary has forbidden it, and it might easily cause thy unhappiness. Then she was silent, but the desire in her heart was not stilled, but gnawed there and tormented her, and let her have no rest. And once, when the angels had all gone out, she thought, Now I am quite alone, and I could peep in. If I do it, no one will ever know. She sought out the key, and when she had got it in her hand, she put it in the lock. And when she had put it in, she turned it round as well. The door sprang open, and she saw there the Trinity, sitting in fire and splendor. She stayed there a while, and looked at everything in amazement. Then she touched the light a little with her finger, and her finger became quite golden. Immediately a great fear fell upon her. She shut the door violently and ran away. Her terror, too, would not quit her, let her do what she might, and her heart beat continually and would not be still. The gold stayed on her finger and would not go away. Let her rub it and wash it never so much. It was not long before the Virgin Mary came back from her journey. She called the little girl before her and asked her to have the keys of heaven back. When the maiden gave her the bunch, the virgin looked into her eyes and said, Hast thou opened the thirteenth door also? No, she replied. Then she laid her hand on the girl's heart and felt how it beat and beat, and saw right well that she had disobeyed her order and had opened the door. Then she said once again, Art thou certain that thou hast not done it? Yes, said the girl for the second time. Then she perceived the finger which had become golden from touching the fire of heaven, and saw well that the child had sinned, and said for the third time, Hast thou not done it? No, said the girl for the third time. Then said the Virgin Mary, Thou hast not obeyed me, and besides that, Thou hast lied. Thou art no longer worthy to be in heaven. Then the girl fell into a deep sleep, and when she awoke, she lay on the earth below, and in the midst of a wilderness. She wanted to cry out, but 
She could bring forth no sound. She sprang up and wanted to run away, but whithersoever she turned herself, she was continually held back by thick hedges of thorns through which she could not break. In the desert in which she was imprisoned, there stood an old hollow tree, and this had to be her dwelling place. Into this she crept when night came, and here she slept. Here, too, she found a shelter from storm and rain, but it was a miserable life, and bitterly did she weep when she remembered how happy she had been in heaven and how the angels had played with her. Roots and berries were her only food, and for these she sought as far as she could go. In the autumn, she picked up the fallen nuts and leaves and carried them into the hole. The nuts were her food in winter, and when snow and ice came, she crept among the leaves like a poor little animal that she might not freeze. Before long, her clothes were all torn, and one bit of them after another fell off her. As soon, however, as the sun shone warm again, she went out and sat in front of the tree, and her long hair covered her on all sides like a mantle. Thus she sat year after year, and felt the pain and the misery of the world. One day, when the trees were once more clothed in fresh green, the king of the country was hunting in the forest, and followed a roe, and as it had fled into the thicket, which shut in this part of the forest, he got off his horse, tore the bushes asunder, and cut himself a path with his sword. When he had at last forced his way through, he saw a wonderfully beautiful maiden sitting under the tree, and she sat there and was entirely covered with her golden hair down to her very feet. He stood still and looked at her full of surprise. Then he spoke to her and said, Who art thou? Why art thou sitting here in the wilderness? But she gave him no answer, for she could not open her mouth. The king continued, Wilt thou go with me to my castle? Then she just nodded her head a little. The king took her in his arms, carried her to his horse, and rode home with her. And when he reached the royal castle, he caused her to be dressed in beautiful garments, and gave her all things in abundance. Although she could not speak, she was still so beautiful and charming that he began to love her with all his heart. And it was not long before he married her. After a year or so had passed, the queen brought a son into the world. Thereupon, the Virgin Mary appeared to her in the night when she lay in her bed alone and said, If thou wilt tell the truth and confess that thou didst unlock the forbidden door, I will open thy mouth and give thee back thy speech. But if thou perseverest in thy sin and deniest obstinately, I will take thy newborn child away with me. Then the queen was permitted to answer, but she remained hard and said, No, I did not open the forbidden door. And the Virgin Mary took the newborn child from her arms and vanished with it. Next morning, when the child was not to be found, it was whispered among the people that the queen was a man-eater and had killed her own child. She heard all this and could say nothing to the contrary. But the king would not believe it, for he loved her so much. When a year had gone by, the queen again bore a son, and in the night the Virgin Mary again came to her and said, If thou wilt confess that thou openest the forbidden door, I will give thee thy child back, and untie thy tongue. But if thou continuest in sin, and deniest it, I will take away with me this new child also. Then the queen again said, No, I did not open the forbidden door. And the virgin took the child out of her arms and away with her to heaven. Next morning, when this child also had disappeared, the people declared quite loudly that the queen had devoured it, and the king's counselors demanded that she should be brought to justice. The king, however, loved her so dearly that he would not believe it and commanded the counselors under pain of death not to say any more about it. 
The following year, the queen gave birth to a beautiful little daughter, and for the third time the Virgin Mary appeared to her in the night and said, Follow me. She took the queen by the hand and led her to heaven, and showed her there her two eldest children, who smiled at her, and were playing with the ball of the world. When the queen rejoiced thereat, the Virgin Mary said, Is thy heart not yet softened? If thou wilt own that thou openedest the forbidden door, I will give thee back thy two little sons. But for the third time, the queen answered, No, I did not open the forbidden door. Then the virgin let her sink down to earth once more, and took from her likewise her third child. Next morning, when the loss was reported abroad, all the people cried loudly, The queen is a man-eater. She must be judged. And the king was no longer able to restrain his counselors. Thereupon the trial was held, and as she could not answer and defend herself, she was condemned to be burnt alive. The wood was got together, and when she was fast bound to the stake, and the fire began to burn round about her, the hard ice of her pride melted. Her heart was moved by repentance, and she thought, If I could but confess before my death that I opened the door. Then her voice came back to her, and she cried out loudly, Yes, Mary, I did it. And straight away rain fell from the sky, and extinguished the flames of fire, and a light broke forth above her, and the Virgin Mary descended with the two little boys by her side, and the new-born daughter in her arms. She spoke kindly to her and said, He who repents of his sin and acknowledges it is forgiven. Then she gave her the three children, untied her tongue, and granted her happiness for her whole life. End of Story 3「Story 4 of Household Tales」recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt. The Story of the Youth Who Went Forth to Learn What Fear Was A certain father had two sons, the elder of whom was smart and sensible and could do everything, but the younger was stupid and could neither learn nor understand anything. And when people saw him, they said, There's a fellow who will give his father some trouble. When anything had to be done, it was always the elder who was forced to do it. But if his father bade him fetch anything when it was late, or in the night time and the way led through the churchyard or any other dismal place, he answered, Oh no, father, I'll not go there. It makes me shudder. For he was afraid. Or when stories were told by the fire at night, which made the flesh creep, the listeners sometimes said, Oh, it makes us shudder. The younger sat in a corner and listened with the rest of them and could not imagine what they could mean. They are always saying, It makes me shudder, it makes me shudder. It does not make me shudder, thought he. That too must be an art of which I understand nothing. Now it came to pass that his father said to him one day, Hearken to me, thou fellow in the corner there, thou art growing tall and strong, and thou too must learn something by which thou canst earn thy living. Look how thy brother works, but thou dost not even earn thy salt. Well, father, he replied, I am quite willing to learn something indeed, if it could but be managed, and I should like to learn how to shudder. I don't understand that at all yet. The elder brother smiled when he heard that, and thought to himself, Good God, what a blockhead that brother of mine is. He will never be good for anything as long as he lives. He who wants to be a sickle must bend himself betimes. The father sighed and answered him, Thou shalt soon learn what it is to shudder, but thou wilt not earn thy bread by that. Soon after this, the sexton came to the house on a visit, 
and the father bewailed his trouble, and told him how his younger son was so backward in every respect that he knew nothing and learnt nothing. Just think, said he, when I asked him how he was going to earn his bread, he actually wanted to learn to shudder. If that be all, replied the sexton, he can learn that with me. Send him to me, and I will soon polish him. The father was glad to do it, for he thought, it will train the boy a little. The sexton, therefore, took him into his house, and he had to ring the bell. After a day or two, the sexton awoke him at midnight, and bade him arise and go up into the church tower and ring the bell. Thou shalt soon learn what shuddering is, thought he, and secretly went there before him. And when the boy was at the top of the tower and turned round and was just going to take hold of the bell rope, he saw a white figure standing on the stairs opposite the sounding hole. Who is there? cried he. But the figure made no reply, and did not move or stir. Give an answer, cried the boy, or take thyself off. Thou hast no business here at night. The sexton, however, remained standing motionless, that the boy might think he was a ghost. The boy cried a second time, What do you want here? Speak if thou art an honest fellow, or I will throw thee down the steps. The sexton thought, he can't intend to be as bad as his words, uttered no sound, and stood as if he were made of stone. Then the boy called to him for the third time, and as that was also to no purpose, he ran against him and pushed the ghost down the stairs, so that it fell down ten steps and remained lying there in a corner. Thereupon he rang the bell, went home, and without saying a word went to bed and fell asleep. The sexton's wife waited a long time for her husband, but he did not come back. At length she became uneasy, and wakened the boy and asked, Dost thou not know where my husband is? He climbed up the tower before thou didst. No, I don't know, replied the boy, but someone was standing by the sounding hole on the other side of the steps, and as he would neither give an answer nor go away, I took him for a scoundrel and threw him downstairs. Just go there and you will see if it was he. I should be sorry if it were. The woman ran away and found her husband, who was lying moaning in the corner, and had broken his leg. She carried him down, and then with loud screams she hastened to the boy's father. Your boy, cried she, has been the cause of a great misfortune. He has thrown my husband down the steps and made him break his leg. Take the good-for-nothing fellow away from our house. The father was terrified and ran thither and scolded the boy. What wicked tricks are these, said he. The devil must have put this into thy head. Father, he replied, do listen to me. I am quite innocent. He was standing there by night like one who was intending to do some evil. I did not know who it was, and I entreated him three times either to speak or to go away. Ah, said the father, I have nothing but unhappiness with you. Go out of my sight. I will see thee no more. Yes, father, right willingly, wait only until it is day. Then will I go forth and learn how to shudder, and then I shall, at any rate, understand one art which will support me. Learn what thou wilt, spake the father, it is all the same to me. Here are fifty thalers for thee. Take these and go into the wide world, and tell no one from whence thou comest. And who is thy father, for I have reason to be ashamed of thee? Yes, father, it shall be as you will. If you desire nothing more than that, I can easily keep it in mind. When day dawned, therefore, the boy put his fifty thalers into his pocket and went forth on the great highway and continually said to himself, If I could but shudder, if I could but shudder. Then a man approached who heard this conversation which the youth was holding with himself, and when they had walked a little farther to where they could see the gallows, the man said to him, Look. There is the tree where seven men have married the rope maker's daughter and are now learning how to fly. Sit down below it and wait till night comes, and you will soon learn how to shudder. If that is all that is wanted, answered the youth, it is easily done. But if I learn how to shudder as fast as that, thou shalt have my fifty thalers. Just come back to me early in the morning. Then the youth went to the gallows, sat down below it, and waited till evening came. And as he was cold, he lighted himself a fire, but at midnight the wind blew so sharply that in spite of his fire he could not get warm. 
and as the wind knocked the hanged men against each other and they moved backwards and forwards, he thought to himself, Thou shiverest below by the fire, but how those up above must freeze and suffer. And as he felt pity for them, he raised the ladder and climbed up, unbound one of them after the other and brought down all seven. Then he stirred the fire, blew it, and set them all round it to warm themselves. But they sat there and did not stir, and the fire caught their clothes. So he said, Take care, or I will hang you up again. The dead men, however, did not hear, but were quite silent, and let their rags go on burning. On this he grew angry and said, If you will not take care, I cannot help you. I will not be burnt with you. And he hung them up again, each in his turn. Then he sat down by his fire and fell asleep. And the next morning the man came to him and wanted to have the fifty thalers and said, Well, dost thou know how to shudder? No, answered he. How was I to get to know? Those fellows up there did not open their mouths and were so stupid that they let the few old rags which they had on their bodies get burnt. Then the man saw that he would not get the fifty thalers that day and went away saying, one of this kind has never come my way before. The youth likewise went his way, and once more began to mutter to himself, Ah, if I could but shudder! Ah, if I could but shudder! A wagoner who was striding behind him heard that and asked, Who are you? I don't know, answered the youth. Then the wagoner asked, From whence comest thou? I know not. Who is thy father? that I may not tell thee. What is it that thou art always muttering between thy teeth? Ah, replied the youth, I do so wish I could shudder, but no one can teach me how to do it. Give up thy foolish chatter, said the wagoner. Come, go with me, and I will see about a place for thee. The youth went with the wagoner, and in the evening they arrived at an inn where they wished to pass the night. Then at the entrance of the room the youth again said quite loudly, if I could but shudder, if I could but shudder. The host who heard this laughed and said, If that is your desire, there ought to be a good opportunity for you here. Ah, be silent, said the hostess. So many inquisitive persons have already lost their lives. It would be a pity and a shame if such beautiful eyes as these should never see the daylight again. But the youth said, However difficult it may be, I will learn it. And for this purpose, indeed, I have journeyed forth. He let the host have no rest until the latter told him that not far from thence stood a haunted castle where anyone could very easily learn what shuddering was, if he would but watch in it for three nights. The king had promised that he who would venture should have his daughter to wife, and she was the most beautiful maiden the sun shone on. Great treasures likewise lay in the castle which were guarded by evil spirits, and these treasures would then be freed and would make a poor man rich enough. Already many men had gone into the castle, but as yet none had come out again. Then the youth went next morning to the king and said if he were allowed he would watch three nights in the haunted castle. The king looked at him, and as the youth pleased him, he said, Thou mayest ask for three things to take into the castle with thee, but they must be things without life. Then he answered, Then I ask for a fire, a turning lathe, and a cutting board with a knife. The king had these things carried into the castle for him during the day. When night was drawing near, the youth went up and made himself a bright fire in one of the rooms, placed the cutting board and knife beside it, and seated himself by the turning lathe. Ah, if I could but shudder, said he, but I shall not learn it here either. Towards midnight he was about to poke his fire, and as he was blowing it, something cried suddenly from one corner. Ah, meow, how cold we are! You simpletons, cried he, what are you crying about? If you are cold, come and take a seat by the fire and warm yourselves. And when he had said that, two great black cats came with one tremendous leap and sat down on each side of him and looked savagely at him with their fiery eyes. After a short time, when they had warmed themselves, they said, Comrade, shall we have a game at cards? Why not? he replied, but just show me your paws. Then they stretched out their claws. Oh, said he, what long nails you have. 
Wait, I must first cut them for you. Thereupon he seized them by the throats, put them on the cutting board, and screwed their feet fast. I have looked at your fingers, said he, and my fancy for card playing has gone. And he struck them dead and threw them out into the water. But when he had made away with these two and was about to sit down again by his fire, out from every hole and corner came black cats and black dogs with red-hot chains, and more and more of them came until he could no longer stir. And they yelled horribly and got on his fire, pulled it to pieces, and tried to put it out. He watched them for a while quietly, but at last, when they were going too far, he seized his cutting knife and cried, Away with ye vermin! and began to cut them down. Part of them ran away, the others he killed and threw out into the fish pond. When he came back, he fanned the embers of his fire again and warmed himself. And as he thus sat, his eyes would keep open no longer, and he felt a desire to sleep. Then he looked round and saw a great bed in the corner. That is the very thing for me, said he, and got into it. When he was just going to shut his eyes, however, the bed began to move of its own accord and went over the whole of the castle. That's right, said he, but go faster. Then the bed rolled on as if six horses were harnessed to it, up and down over thresholds and steps. But suddenly, hop, hop, it turned over upside down and lay on him like a mountain. But he threw quilts and pillows up in the air, got out and said, Now anyone who likes may drive and lay down by his fire, and slept till it was day. In the morning the king came, and when he saw him lying there on the ground, he thought the evil spirits had killed him, and he was dead. Then said he, After all, it is a pity, he is a handsome man. The youth heard it, got up, and said, It has not come to that yet. Then the king was astonished, but very glad, and asked how he had fared. Very well indeed, answered he. One night is past, the two others will get over likewise. Then he went to the innkeeper, who opened his eyes very wide, and said, I never expected to see thee alive again. Hast thou learnt how to shudder yet? No, said he, it is all in vain. If someone would but tell me. The second night he again went up into the old castle, sat down by the fire, and once more began his old song. If I could but shudder. Midnight came, and uproar and noise of tumbling about was heard. At first it was low, but it grew louder and louder. Then it was quiet for a while, and at length with a loud scream, half a man came down the chimney and fell before him. Hello, cried he, another half belongs to this. This is too little. Then the uproar began again. There was roaring and howling, and the other half fell down likewise. Wait, said he, I will just blow up the fire a little for thee. When he had done that and looked round again, the two pieces were joined together, and a frightful man was sitting in his place. That is no part of our bargain, said the youth. The bench is mine. The man wanted to push him away. The youth, however, would not allow that, but thrust him off with all his strength, and seated himself again in his own place. Then still more men fell down, one after the other. They brought nine dead men's legs and two skulls, and set them up and played at nine pins with them. The youth also wanted to play, and said, Hark you, can I join you? Yes, if thou hast any money. Money enough, replied he, but your balls are not quite round. Then he took the skulls and put them in the lathe, and turned them until they were round. There now, they will roll better, said he. Hurrah! Now it goes merrily. He played with them and lost some of his money, but when it struck twelve, everything vanished from his sight. He lay down and quietly fell asleep. Next morning the king came to inquire after him. How has it fared with you this time? asked he. I've been playing at nine pins, he answered, and have lost a couple of farthings. Hast thou not shuddered then? Eh, what? said he. I have made merry, if I did but know what it was to shudder. The third night he sat down again on his bench and said quite sadly, If I could but shudder. When it grew late, six tall men came in and brought a coffin. Then said he, Ha ha, that is certainly my little cousin who died only a few days ago. And he beckoned with his finger and cried, Come, little cousin, come. 
They placed the coffin on the ground, but he went to it and took the lid off, and a dead man lay therein. He felt his face, but it was as cold as ice. Stop, said he, I will warm thee a little, and went to the fire and warmed his hand and laid it on the dead man's face, but he remained cold. Then he took him out and sat down by the fire and laid him on his breast and rubbed his arms that the blood might circulate again. As this also did no good, he thought to himself, when two people lie in bed together, they warm each other, and carried him to the bed, covered him over, and lay down by him. After a short time, the dead man became warm too and began to move. Then said the youth, See, little cousin, have I not warmed thee? The dead man, however, got up and cried, Now I will strangle thee. What, said he, is that the way thou thankest me? Thou shalt at once go into thy coffin again. And he took him up, threw him into it, and shut the lid. Then came the six men and carried him away again. I cannot manage to shudder, said he. I shall never learn it here as long as I live. Then a man entered who was taller than all others and looked terrible. He was old, however, and had a long white beard. Thou wretch, cried he, thou shalt soon learn what it is to shudder, for thou shalt die. Not so fast, replied the youth. If I am to die, I shall have to have a say in it. I will soon seize thee, said the fiend. Softly, softly, do not talk so big. I am as strong as thou art, and perhaps even stronger. We shall see, said the old man. If thou art stronger, I will let thee go. Come, we will try. Then he led him by dark passages to a smith's forge, took an axe, and with one blow struck an anvil into the ground. I can do better than that, said the youth, and went to the other anvil. The old man placed himself near and wanted to look on, and his white beard hung down. Then the youth seized the axe, split the anvil with one blow, and struck the old man's beard in with it. Now I have thee, said the youth. Now it is thou who will have to die. Then he seized an iron bar and beat the old man till he moaned and entreated him to stop, and he would give him great riches. The youth drew out the axe and let him go. The old man led him back into the castle, and in a cellar showed him three chests full of gold. Of these, said he, one part is for the poor, the other for the king, and the third is thine. In the meantime it struck twelve, and the spirit disappeared. The youth, therefore, was left in darkness. I shall still be able to find my way out, said he, and felt about, found the way into the room, and slept there by his fire. Next morning the king came and said, Now thou must have learnt what shuddering is. No, he answered, what can it be? My dead cousin was here, and a bearded man came and showed me a great deal of money down below, but no one told me what it was to shudder. Then, said the king, thou hast delivered the castle, and shalt marry my daughter. That is all very well, said he, but still I do not know what it is to shudder. Then the gold was brought up, and the wedding celebrated. But howsoever much the young king loved his wife, and however happy he was, he still said always, If I could but shudder, if I could but shudder. And at last she was angry at this. Her waiting maid said, I will find a cure for him. He shall soon learn what it is to shudder. She went out to the stream which flowed through the garden and had a whole bucket full of gudgeons brought to her. That night when the young king was sleeping, his wife was to draw the clothes off him and empty the bucket full of cold water with the gudgeons in it over him, so that the little fishes would sprawl about him. When this was done, he woke up and cried, Oh, what makes me shudder so? What makes me shudder so, dear wife? Ah, now I know what it is to shudder. End of story four. Story five of Household Tales. Household Tales by Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt. The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids There was once upon a time an old goat who had seven little kids, and loved them with all the love of a mother for her children. 
One day she wanted to go into the forest and fetch some food, so she called all seven to her and said, Dear children, I have to go into the forest. Be on your guard against the wolf. If he comes in, he will devour you all, skin, hair, and all. The wretch often disguises himself, but you will know him at once by his rough voice and his black feet. The kids said, Dear mother, we will take good care of ourselves. You may go away without any anxiety. Then the old one bleated and went on her way with an easy mind. It was not long before someone knocked at the house door and called, Open the door, dear children. Your mother is here and has brought something back with her for each of you. But the little kids knew that it was the wolf by the rough voice. We will not open the door, cried they. Thou art not our mother. She has a soft, pleasant voice, but thy voice is rough. Thou art the wolf. Then the wolf went away to a shopkeeper and bought himself a great lump of chalk, ate this, and made his voice soft with it. Then he came back, knocked at the door of the house, and cried, Open the door, dear children. Your mother is here and has brought something back with her for each of you. But the wolf had laid his black paws against the window. The children saw them and cried, We will not open the door. Our mother has not black feet like thee. Thou art the wolf. Then the wolf ran to a baker and said, I have hurt my feet. Rub some dough over them for me. And when the baker had rubbed his feet over, he ran to the miller and said, Strew some white meal over my feet for me. The miller thought to himself, The wolf wants to deceive someone and refused. But the wolf said, if thou wilt not do it, I will devour thee. Then the miller was afraid and made his paws white for him. Truly men are like that. So now the wretch went for the third time to the house door, knocked at it, and said, Open the door for me, children. Your dear little mother has come home and has brought every one of you something back from the forest with her. The little kids cried. First show us thy paws, that we may know if thou art our dear little mother. Then he put his paws in through the window, and when the kids saw that they were white, they believed that all he said was true, and opened the door. But who should come in but the wolf? They were terrified and wanted to hide themselves. One sprang under the table, the second into the bed, the third into the stove, the fourth into the kitchen, the fifth into the cupboard, the sixth under the washing bowl, and the seventh into the clock case. But the wolf found them all, and used no great ceremony. One after the other, he swallowed them down his throat. The youngest, who was in the clock case, was the only one he did not find. When the wolf had satisfied his appetite, he took himself off laid himself down under a tree in the green meadow outside and began to sleep. Soon afterwards, the old goat came home again from the forest. Ah, oh, what a sight she saw there! The house door stood wide open. The table chairs and benches were thrown down, the washing bowl lay broken to pieces, and the quilts and pillows were pulled off the bed. She sought her children, but they were nowhere to be found. She called them one after another by name, but no one answered. At last, when she came to the youngest, a soft voice cried, Dear mother, I am in the clock case. She took the kid out, and it told her that the wolf had come and had eaten all the others. Then you may imagine how she wept over her poor children. At length in her grief she went out, and the youngest kid ran with her. When they came to the meadow, there lay the wolf by the tree, and snored so loud that the branches shook. She looked at him on every side, and saw that something was moving and struggling in his gorged belly. Ah, heavens, said she, is it possible that my poor children, whom he has swallowed down for a supper, can still be alive? Then the kid had to run home and fetch scissors and a needle and thread. And the goat cut open the monster's stomach, and hardly had she made one cut than one little kid thrust its head out. And when she cut farther, all six sprang out, one after another, and were all still alive and had suffered no injury whatever, for in his greediness the monster had swallowed them down whole. What rejoicing there was! They embraced their dear mother, and jumped like a sailor at his wedding. The mother, however, said, 
Now go and look for some big stones, and we will fill the wicked beast's stomach with them while he is still asleep. Then the seven kids dragged the stones thither with all speed, and put as many of them into his stomach as they could get in. And the mother sewed him up again in the greatest haste, so that he was not aware of anything, and never once stirred. When the wolf at length had had his sleep out, he got on his legs, and as the stones in his stomach made him very thirsty, he wanted to go to a well to drink. But when he began to walk and move about, the stones in his stomach knocked against each other and rattled. Then cried he, What rumbles and tumbles against my poor bones? I thought to a six kids, but it's not but big stones. And when he got to the well and stooped over the water and was just about to drink, the heavy stones made him fall in, and there was no help, but he had to drown miserably. When the seven kids saw that, they came running to the spot and cried aloud, The wolf is dead! The wolf is dead! And danced for joy round about the well with their mother. End of story five. Story six of Household Tales, recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, and translated by Margaret Hunt. Faithful John. There was once on a time an old king who was ill and thought to himself, I am lying on what must be my deathbed. Then said he, Tell Faithful John to come to me. Faithful John was his favorite servant, and was so called because he had for his whole life long been so true to him. When therefore he came beside the bed, the king said to him, Most faithful John, I feel my end approaching, and have no anxiety except about my son. He is still of tender age, and cannot always know how to guide himself. If thou dost not promise me to teach him everything that he ought to know, and to be his foster father, I cannot close my eyes in peace. Then answered faithful John, I will not forsake him, and I will serve him with fidelity, even if it should cost me my life. On this the old king said, Now I die in comfort and peace. Then he added, After my death thou shalt show him the whole castle, all the chambers, halls, and vaults, and all the treasures which lie therein but the last chamber and the long gallery in which is the picture of the princess of the golden dwelling shalt thou not show. If he sees that picture, he will fall violently in love with her and will drop down in a swoon and go through great danger for her sake. Therefore thou must preserve him from that. And when faithful John had once more given his promise to the old king about this, the king said no more, but laid his head on his pillow and died. When the old king had been carried to his grave, faithful John told the young king all that he had promised his father on his deathbed, and said, This will I assuredly perform, and will be faithful to thee as I have been faithful to him, even it should cost me my life. When the morning was over, faithful John said to him, It is now time that thou should see thine inheritance. I will show thee thy father's palace. Then he took him about everywhere, up and down, and let him see all the riches and the magnificent apartments. Only there was one room which he did not open, and that in which hung the dangerous picture. The picture was, however, so placed that when the door was opened you looked straight on it, and it was so admirably painted that it seemed to breathe and live, and there was nothing more charming or more beautiful in the whole world. The young king, however, plainly remarked that faithful John always walked past this one door, and said, Why dost thou never open this one for me? There is something within it, he replied, which would terrify thee. But the king answered, I have seen all the palace, and I will know what is in this room also. And he went and tried to break open the door by force. Then faithful John held him back and said, I promised thy father before his death that thou shouldst not see that which is in this chamber. It might bring the greatest misfortune on thee and on me. Ah, oh, no, replied the young king. If I do not go in, it will be my certain destruction. I should have no rest day or night until I had seen it with my own eyes. I shall not leave the palace now until thou hast unlocked the door. 
Then faithful John saw that there was no help for it now, and with a heavy heart and many sighs sought out the key from the great bunch. When he had opened the door, he went in first, and thought by standing before him he could hide the portrait, so that the king should not see it in front of him. But what availed that? The king stood on tiptoe and saw it over his shoulder. And when he saw the portrait of the maiden, which was so magnificent and shone with gold and precious stones, he fell fainting to the ground. Faithful John took him up, carried him to his bed, and sorrowfully thought, The misfortune has befallen us, Lord God, what will be the end of it? Then he strengthened him with wine until he came to himself again. The first words the king said were, Ah, the beautiful portrait, whose is it? That is the princess of the golden dwelling, answered faithful John. Then the king continued, My love for her is so great that if all the leaves on all the trees were tongues, they could not declare it. I will give my life to win her. Thou art my most faithful John, thou must help me. The faithful servant considered within himself for a long time how to set about the matter, for it was difficult even to obtain a sight of the king's daughter. At length he thought of a way, and said to the king, Everything which she has about her is of gold. Tables, chairs, dishes, glasses, bowls, and household furniture. Among thy treasures are five tons of gold. Let one of the goldsmiths of the kingdom work these up into all manner of vessels and utensils, into all kinds of birds, wild beasts, and strange animals, such as may please her, and we will go there with them and try our luck. The king ordered all the goldsmiths to be brought to him, and they were had to work night and day until at last the most splendid things were prepared. When everything was stowed on board a ship, faithful John put on the dress of a merchant, and the king was forced to do the same in order to make himself quite unrecognizable. Then they sailed across the sea and sailed on until they came to the town wherein dwelt the princess of the golden dwelling. Faithful John bade the king stay behind on the ship and wait for him. Perhaps I shall bring the princess with me, said he. Therefore see that everything is in order. Have the golden vessels set out and the whole ship decorated. Then he gathered together in his apron all kinds of gold things, went on shore, and walked straight to the royal palace. When he entered the courtyard of the palace, a beautiful girl was standing there by the well with two golden buckets in her hand, drawing water with them. And when she was just turning round to carry away the sparkling water, she saw the stranger and asked who he was. So he answered, I am a merchant, and opened his apron and let her look in. Then she cried, Oh, what beautiful gold things, and put her pails down and looked at the golden wares one after the other. Then said the girl, The princess must see these. She has such great pleasure in golden things that she will buy all you have. Then she took him by the hand and led him upstairs, for she was the waiting maid. When the king's daughter saw the wares, she was quite delighted and said, They are so beautifully worked that I will buy them all of thee. But faithful John said, I am only the servant of a rich merchant. The things I have here are not to be compared with those my master has in his ship. They are the most beautiful and valuable things that have ever been made in gold. She wanted to have everything brought to her there, but he said, There are so many of them that it would take a great many days to do that, and so many rooms would be required to exhibit them that your house is not big enough. Then her curiosity and longing were still more excited, until at last she said, Conduct me to the ship. I will go there myself and behold the treasures of thine master. On this faithful John was quite delighted, and led her to the ship, and when the king saw her, he perceived that her beauty was even greater than the picture had represented it to be, and thought no other than that his heart would burst in twain. Then she got into the ship, and the king led her within. Faithful John, however, remained behind with the pilot, and ordered the ship to be pushed off, saying, Set all sail, till it fly like a bird in the air. Within, however, the king showed her the golden vessels, every one of them also the wild beasts and strange animals. Many hours went by while she was seeing everything, and in her delight she did not observe that the ship was sailing away. After she had looked at the last, she thanked the merchant and wanted to go home, but when she came to the side of the ship, 
she saw that it was on the deep sea far from land, and hurrying onwards with all sail set. Ah, cried she in her alarm, I am betrayed. I am carried away and have fallen into the power of a merchant. I would die, rather. The king, however, seized her hand and said, I am not a merchant. I am a king, and of no meaner origin than thou art. And if I have carried thee away with subtlety, it has come to pass because of my exceeding great love for thee. The first time that I looked on thy portrait, I fell fainting to the ground. When the princess of the gold dwelling heard that, she was comforted and her heart was inclined unto him, so that she willingly consented to be his wife. It so happened, however, while they were sailing onwards over the deep sea, that faithful John, who was sitting on the forepart of the vessel making music, saw three ravens in the air which came flying towards them. On this he stopped playing and listened to what they were saying to each other, for that he well understood. One cried, Oh, there he is, carrying home the princess of the golden dwelling. Yes, replied the second, but he has not got her yet, said the third, but he has got her. She is sitting beside him in the ship. And the first began again and cried, What good will that do him? When they reach land, a chestnut horse will leap forward to meet him, and the prince will want to mount it. But if he does that, it will run away with him and rise up into the air with him, and he will never see his maiden more. Spake the second, But is there no escape? Oh, yes. If anyone else gets on it swiftly and takes out the pistol which must be in its holster and shoots the horse dead with it, the young king is saved. But who knows that? And whosoever does know it and tells it to him will be turned to stone from the toe to the knee. Then said the second, I know more than that. Even if the horse be killed, the young king will still not keep his bride. When they go into the castle together, a wrought bridal garment will be laying there in a dish, and looking as if it were woven of gold and silver. It is, however, nothing but sulfur and pitch, and if he put it on, it will burn him to the very bone and marrow, said the third. Is there no escape at all? Oh, yes, replied the second. If anyone with gloves on seizes the garment and throws it into the fire and burns it, the young king will be saved. But what avails that? Whosoever knows it and tells it to him, half his body will become stone from the knee to the heart. Then said the third, I know still more. Even if the bridal garment be burnt, the young king will still not have his bride. After the wedding, when the dancing begins with, and the young queen is dancing, she will suddenly turn pale and fall down as if dead. And if someone does not lift her up and draw three drops of blood from her right breast and spit them out again, she will die. But if anyone who knows that were to declare it, he would become stone from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. When the ravens had spoken of this together, they flew onwards, and faithful John had well understood everything. But from that time forth he became quiet and sad, for if he concealed what he had heard from his master, the latter would be unfortunate. And if he discovered it to him, he himself must sacrifice his life. At length, however, he said to himself, I will save my master, even if it bring destruction on myself. When therefore they came to shore, all happened as had been foretold by the ravens, and a magnificent chestnut horse sprang forward. Good, said the king, he shall carry me to my palace, and was about to mount it when faithful John got before him, jumped quickly on it, drew the pistol out of the holster, and shot the horse. Then the other attendants of the king, who after all were not very fond of faithful John, cried, How shameful to kill the beautiful animal that was to have carried the king to his palace. But the king said, Hold your peace and leave him alone. He is my most faithful John. Who knows what may be the good of that? They went into the palace, and in the hall there stood a dish, and therein lay the bridal garment looking no otherwise than if it were made of gold and silver. The young king went towards it and was about to take hold of it, but faithful John pushed him away, seized it with gloves on, carried it quickly to the fire, and burnt it. The other attendants again began to murmur and said, Behold, now he is even burning the king's bridal garment. But the young king said, Who knows what good he may have done? Leave him alone. He is my most faithful John. And now the wedding was solemnized. The dance began, and the bride also took part in it. Then faithful John was watchful and looked into her face, and suddenly she turned pale and fell to the ground as if she were dead. 
On this he ran hastily to her, lifted her up and bore her into a chamber. Then he laid her down and knelt and sucked the three drops of blood from her right breast and spat them out. Immediately she breathed again and recovered herself, but the young king had seen this, and being ignorant why faithful John had done it, was angry and cried, Throw him into a dungeon! Next morning faithful John was condemned and led to the gallows, and when he stood on high and was about to be executed, he said, Every one who has to die is permitted before his end to make one last speech. May I too claim the right? Yes, answered the king, it shall be granted unto thee. Then said faithful John, I am unjustly condemned, and have always been true to thee. And he related how he had hearkened to the conversation of the ravens when on the sea, and how he had been obliged to do all these things in order to save his master. Then cried the king, O oh, my most faithful John, pardon, pardon, bring him down. But as faithful John spoke the last word, he had fallen down lifeless and become a stone. Thereupon the king and queen suffered great anguish, and the king said, Ah, how ill I have requited great fidelity, and ordered the stone figure to be taken up and placed in his bedroom beside his bed. And as often as he looked on it, he wept and said, Ah, if I could bring thee to life again, my most faithful John. Some time passed, and the queen bore twins, two sons who grew fast and were her delight. Once when the queen was at church, and the two children were sitting playing beside their father, the latter, full of grief, again looked at the stone figure, sighed, and said, Ah, if I could but bring thee to life again, my most faithful John. Then the stone began to speak, and said, Thou canst bring me to life again, if thou wilt use for that purpose what is dearest to thee. Then cried the king, I will give everything I have in the world for thee. The stone continued, If thou wilt cut off the heads of thy two children with thine own hand and sprinkle me with their blood, I shall be restored to life. The king was terrified when he heard that he himself must kill his dearest children, but he thought of faithful John's great fidelity and how he had died for him, drew his sword, and with his own hand cut off the children's heads. And when he had smeared the stone with their blood, life returned to it, and faithful John stood once more safe and healthy before him. He said to the king, Thy truth shall not go unrewarded, and took the heads of the children, put them on again, and rubbed the wounds with their blood, on which they became whole again immediately, and jumped about and went on playing as if nothing had happened. Then the king was full of joy, and when he saw the queen coming, he hid faithful John and the two children in a great cupboard. When she entered, he said to her, Hast thou been praying in the church? Yes, answered she, but I have constantly been thinking of faithful John and what misfortune has befallen him through us. Then said he, Dear wife, we can give him life again, but it will cost us our two little sons, whom we must sacrifice. The queen turned pale and her heart was full of terror. But she said, We owe it to him for his great fidelity. Then the king was rejoiced that she thought as he had thought, and went and opened the cupboard, and brought forth faithful John and the children, and said, God be praised, he is delivered, and we have our little sons again also, and told her how everything had occurred. Then they dwelt together in much happiness until their death. End of Story 6、Story、number seven of Household Tales Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Good Bargain There was once a peasant who had driven his cow to the fair and sold her for seven thalers. On the way home he had to pass a pond, and already from afar he heard the fogs crying, Ache! Ache! Ache, ache. Well, said he to himself, they're talking without rhyme or reason. It is seven that I have received, not eight. When he got to the water, he cried to them, Stupid animals that you are, don't you know better than that? It is seven thalers and not eight. The frogs, however, stood there, ache, 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 ache. Come then, if you won't believe it, I can count it out for you. And he took his money out of his pocket and counted out the seven thalers, always reckoning. Four and twenty groschen to a thaler. The frogs, however, paid no attention to his reckoning, but still cried, Ache, 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 ache. 
What, cried the peasant, quite angry, since you are determined to know better than I, count it yourselves. And he threw all the money into the water to them. He stood still and wanted to wait until they were done and had brought him his own again. But the frogs maintained their opinion and cried continually, Ache, 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 ache. And besides that, did not throw the money out again. He still waited a long while until evening came on and he was forced to go home. Then he abused the frogs and cried, You water splashers, you thick heads, you Google eyes, you have great mouths and you can screech till you hurt one's ears, but you cannot count seven thalers. Do you think I'm going to stand here till you get done? And with that he went away. But the frog still cried, ache, 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 after him, till he went home quite angry. After a while he bought another cow, which he killed, and he made the calculation that if he sold the meat well, he might gain as much as the two cows were worth and having the skin into the bargain. When therefore he got to the town with the meat, a great troop of dogs were gathered together in front of the gate, with a large greyhound at the head of them which jumped at the meat, sniffed at it, and barked, Wow, wow, wow! As there was no stopping him, the peasant said to him, Yes, yes, I know quite well that thou art saying, Wow, 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 because thou wantest some of the meat, but I should fare badly if I were to give it to thee. The dog, however, answered nothing but wow, wow. Wilt thou promise not to devour it all then? And wilt thou go bail for thy companions? Wow, 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 said the dog. Well, if thou insist on it, I will leave it for thee. I know thee well, and know who is thy master. But this I tell thee, I must have my money in three days, or else it will go ill with thee. Thou must just bring it out to me. Thereupon he unloaded the meat and turned back again. The dogs fell upon it and loudly barked, Wow, wow! The countryman, who heard them from afar, said to himself, Hark, now they all want some, but the big one is responsible to me for it. When three days had passed, the countryman thought, Tonight my money will be in my pocket, and was quite delighted, but no one would come to pay it. There is no trusting anyone now, said he, and at last he lost patience, and went into the town to the butcher and demanded his money. The butcher thought it was a joke, but the peasant said, Jesting apart, I will have my money. Did not the great dog bring you the whole of the slaughtered cow three days ago? Then the butcher grew angry, snatched a broomstick, and drove him out. Wait a while, said the peasant, till there is some justice in the world, and went to the royal palace and begged for an audience. He was led before the king, who sat there with his daughter, and asked him what injury he had suffered. At last, said he, The frogs and the dogs have taken from me what is mine, and the butcher has paid me for it with a stick. And he related at full all that had happened. Thereupon the king's daughter began to laugh heartily, and the king said to him, I cannot give you justice in this, but you shall have my daughter to wife for it. In her whole life she has never yet laughed as she has just done at thee, and I have promised her to him who could make her laugh. Thou mayest thank God for thy good fortune. Oh, answered the peasant, I will not have her, but I have a wife already, and she is one too many for me. When I get home it is just as bad as if I had a wife standing in every corner. Then the king grew angry and said, Thou art a bore. Ah, oh, Lord King, replied the peasant, what can you expect from an ox but beef? Stop, answered the king, thou shalt have another reward. Be off now, but come back in three days, and then thou shalt have five hundred counted out in full. When the peasant went out by the gate, the sentry said, Thou hast made the king's daughter laugh, so thou wilt certainly receive something good. Yes, that is what I think, answered the peasant. Five hundred are to be counted out to me. Hark thee, said the soldier, give me some of it. What canst thou do with all that money? As it is thou, said the peasant, thou shalt have two hundred. Present thyself in three days' time before the king, and let it be paid to thee. A Jew who was standing by and heard the conversation ran after the peasant, held him by the coat, and said, O oh, wonder, what a luck child thou art! I will change it for thee. 
I will change it for thee into small coins. What dost thou want with the great thalers? Jew, said the countryman, three hundred canst thou still have. Give it to me at once in coin. In three days from this, thou wilt be paid for it by the king. The Jew was delighted with the prophet, and brought the sum in bad Groshen, three of which were worth two good ones. After three days had passed, according to the king's command, the peasant went before the king. Pull off his coat, said the latter, and he shall have his five hundred. Ah, said the peasant, they no longer belong to me. I presented two hundred of them to the sentinel, and three hundred the Jew has changed for me. So by right, nothing at all belongs to me. In the meantime, the soldier and the Jew entered and claimed what they had gained from the peasant, and the received blows strictly counted out. The soldier bore it patiently and knew already how it tasted. But the Jew said sorrowfully, Alas, alas, are these the heavy thalers? The king could not help laughing at the peasant, and as all his anger was gone, he said, As thou hast already lost thy reward before it fell to thy lot, I will give something in the place of it. Go into my treasurer chamber and get some money for thyself, as much as thou wilt. The peasant did not need to be told twice, and stuffed into his big pockets whatsoever would go in. Afterwards he went to an inn and counted out his money. The Jew had crept after him and heard how he muttered to himself, That rogue of a king has cheated me after all. Why could he not have given me the money himself, and then I should have known what I had? How can I tell now if what I have had luck put into my pockets is right or not? Good heaven, said the Jew to himself. That man is speaking disrespectfully of our lord the king. I will run and inform, and then I shall get a great reward, and he shall be punished as well. When the king heard of the peasant's words, he fell into a passion, and commanded the Jews to go and bring the offender to him. The Jew ran to the peasant. You are to go at once to the lord king in the very clothes you have on. I know what's right better than that, answered the peasant. I shall have a new coat made first. Dost thou think that a man with so much money in his pocket is to go there in his ragged old coat? The Jew, as he saw that the peasant would not stir without another coat, and as he feared that if the king's anger cooled, he himself would lose his reward, and the peasant, his punishment, said, I will out of pure friendship lend thee a coat for the short time. What will people not do for love? The peasant was contented with this, put the Jew's coat on, and went off with him. The king reproached the countryman because of the evil speaking of which the Jew had informed him. Ah, said the peasant, what a Jew says is always false. No true word ever comes out of his mouth. That rascal there is capable of maintaining that I have his coat on. What is that? shrieked the Jews. Is the coat not mine? Have I not lent it to thee out of pure friendship, in order that thou might appear before the Lord King? When the king heard that, he said, The Jew has assuredly deceived one or the other of us, either myself or the peasant, and he again ordered something to be counted out to him in hard thalers. The peasant, however, went home in the good coat. With the good money in his pocket, he said to himself, This time I have hit it. End of story seven. Story eight of Household Tales, recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, and translated by Margaret Hunt, the wonderful musician. There was once a wonderful musician who went quite alone through a forest and thought of all manner of things. And when nothing was left for him to think about, he said to himself, Time is beginning to pass heavily with me here in the forest. I will fetch hither a good companion for myself. Then he took his fiddle from his back and played so that it echoed through the trees. It was not long before a wolf came trotting through the thicket towards him. Ah, here is a wolf coming. I have no desire for him, said the musician. But the wolf came nearer and said to him, Ah, dear musician, how beautifully thou dost play. I should like to learn that, too. It is soon learnt, the musician replied. Thou hast only to do all that I bid thee. Oh, musician, said the wolf. 
I will obey thee as a scholar obeys his master. The musician bade him follow, and when they had gone part of the way together, they came to an old oak tree which was hollow inside and cleft in the middle. Look, said the musician, if thou wilt learn to fiddle, put thy four paws into this crevice. The wolf obeyed, but the musician quickly picked up a stone and with one blow wedged his two paws so fast that he was forced to stay there like a prisoner. Stay there until I come back again, said the musician, and went his way. After a while again he said to himself, Time is beginning to pass heavily with me here in the forest. I will fetch hither another companion, and took his fiddle and again played in the forest. It was not long before a fox came creeping through the trees towards him. Ah, there's a fox coming, said the musician. I have no desire for him. The fox came up to him and said, Oh, dear musician, how beautifully thou dost play. I should like to learn that too. That is soon learnt, said the musician. Thou hast only to do everything that I bid thee. O oh, musician, then, said the fox, I will obey thee as a scholar obeys his master. Follow me, said the musician. And when they had walked a part of the way, they came to a footpath with high bushes on both sides of it. There the musician stood still, and from one side bent a young hazel bush down to the ground and put his foot on top of it. Then he bent down a young tree from the other side as well and said, Now, little fox, if thou wilt learn something, give me thy left front paw. The fox obeyed, and the musician fastened his paw to the left bow. Little fox, said he, now reach me thy right paw, and he tied it to the right bow. When he had examined whether they were firm enough, he let go, and the bushes sprang up again and jerked up the little fox so that it hung struggling in the air. Wait there till I come back again, said the musician, and went his way. Again he said to himself, Time is beginning to pass heavily with me here in the forest. I will fetch hither another companion. So he took his fiddle, and the sound echoed through the forest. Then a little hare came springing towards him. Why, a hare is coming, said the musician. I do not want him. Ah, dear musician, said the hare, how beautifully thou dost fiddle. I too should like to learn that. That is soon learnt, said the musician. Thou hast only to do everything that I bid thee. O oh, musician, replied the little hare, I will obey thee as a scholar obeys his master. They went a part of the way together until they came to an open space in the forest where stood an aspen tree. The musician tied a long string round the little hare's neck, the other end of which he fastened to the tree. Now briskly, little hare, run twenty times round the tree, cried the musician. And the little hare obeyed. And when it had run round twenty times, it had twisted the string twenty times round the trunk of the tree, and the little hare was caught and let it pull and tug as it liked, it only made the string cut into its tender neck. Wait there till I come back, said the musician, and went onwards. The wolf in the meantime had pushed and pulled and bitten at the stone and had worked so long that he had set his feet at liberty and had drawn them once more out of the cleft. Full of anger and rage, he hurried after the musician and wanted to tear him to pieces. When the fox saw him running, he began to lament and cried with all his might, Brother Wolf, come to my help, the musician has betrayed me. The wolf drew down the little tree, bit the cord in two, and freed the fox, who went with him to take revenge on the musician. They found the tied-up hare, whom likewise they delivered, and then they all sought the enemy together. The musician had once more played his fiddle as he went on his way, and this time he had been more fortunate. The sound reached the ears of a poor woodcutter who instantly, whether he would or no, gave up his work and came with his hatchet under his arm to listen to the music. At last comes the right companion, said the musician, for I was seeking a human being and no wild beast. And he began and played so beautifully and delightfully that the poor man stood there as if bewitched, and his heart leaped with gladness. And as he thus stood, the wolf, the fox, and the hare came up, and he saw well that they had some evil design. So he raised his glittering axe and placed himself before the musician, as if to say, Whoso wishes to touch him, let him beware, for he will have to do with me. Then the beasts were terrified and ran back into the forest. The musician, however, played once more to the man out of gratitude, and then went onwards. End of story eight.
Story 9 of Household Tales Recording by Rocktai Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Twelve Brothers There were once on a time a king and a queen who lived happily together and had twelve children, but they were all boys. Then said the king to his wife, If the thirteenth child which thou art about to bring into the world is a girl, the twelve boys shall die, in order that her possessions may be great and that the kingdom may fall to her alone. He caused likewise twelve coffins to be made, which were already filled with shavings, and in each lay the little pillow for the dead, and he had them taken into a locked-up room, and then he gave the queen the key of it, and bade her not to speak of this to anyone. The mother, however, now sat and lamented all day long, until the youngest son, who was always with her, and whom she had named Benjamin from the Bible, said to her, Dear mother, why art thou so sad? Dearest child, she answered, I may not tell thee. But he let her have no rest until she went and unlocked the room and showed him the twelve coffins ready filled with shavings. Then she said, My dearest Benjamin, thy father had these coffins made for thee and for thy eleven brothers. For if I bring a little girl into the world, you are all to be killed and buried in them. And as she wept while she was saying this, the son comforted her and said, Weep not, dear mother, we will save ourselves and go hence. But she said, Go forth into the forest with thy eleven brothers, and let one sit constantly on the highest tree which can be found, and keep watch, looking towards the tower here in the castle. If I give birth to a little son, I will put up a white flag, and then you may venture to come back. But if I bear a daughter, I will hoist a red flag, and then fly hence as quickly as you are able, and may the good God protect you. And every night I will rise up and pray for you, in winter that you may be able to warm yourself at a fire, and in summer that you may not faint away in the heat. After she had blessed her sons, therefore, they went forth into the forest. They each kept watch in turn and sat on the highest oak and looked towards the tower. When eleven days had passed and the turn came to Benjamin, he saw that a flag was being raised. It was, however, not the white, but the blood-red flag which announced that they were all to die. When the brothers heard that, they were very angry and said, Are we all to suffer death for the sake of a girl? We swear that we will avenge ourselves. Wheresoever we find a girl, her red blood shall flow. Thereupon they went deeper into the forest, and in the midst of it, where it was the darkest, they found a little bewitched hut, which was standing empty. Then said they, here we will dwell, and thou, Benjamin, who art the youngest and weakest, thou shalt stay at home and keep house, we others will go out and get food. Then they went into the forest and shot hares, wild deer, birds and pigeons, and whatsoever there was to eat. This they took to Benjamin, who had to dress it for them in order that they might appease their hunger. They lived together ten years in the little hut, and the time did not appear long to them. The little daughter, which their mother, the queen, had given birth to, was now grown up. She was good of heart and fair of face, and had a golden star on her forehead. Once, when it was the great washing, she saw twelve men's shirts among the things, and asked her mother, To whom do these twelve shirts belong? for they are far too small for father. And the queen answered with a heavy heart, Dear child, these belong to thy twelve brothers, said the maiden. Where are my twelve brothers? I have never yet heard of them. She replied, God knows where they are. They are wandering about the world. 
Then she took the maiden and opened the chamber for her and showed her the twelve coffins with the shavings and pillows for the head. These coffins, said she, were destined for thy brothers, but they went away secretly before thou wert born. And she related to her how everything had happened. Then said the maiden, Dear mother, weep not, I will go and seek my brothers. So she took the twelve shirts and went forth, and straight into the great forest. She walked the whole day, and in the evening she came to the bewitched hut. Then she entered it and found a young boy who asked, From whence comest thou, and whither art thou bound? And was astonished that she was so beautiful, and wore royal garments, and had a star on her forehead. And she answered, I am a king's daughter, and I am seeking my twelve brothers, and I will walk as far as the sky is blue, until I find them. She likewise showed him the twelve shirts which belonged to them. Then Benjamin saw that she was his sister, and said, I am Benjamin, thy youngest brother. And she began to weep for joy, and Benjamin wept also, and they kissed and embraced each other with the greatest love. But after this he said, Dear sister, there is still one difficulty. We have agreed that every maiden whom we meet shall die, because we have been obliged to leave our kingdom on account of a girl. Then said she, I will willingly die if by so doing I can deliver my twelve brothers. No, answered he, thou shalt not die. Seat thyself beneath this top until our eleven brothers come, and then I will soon come to an agreement with them. She did so, and when it was night, the others came from hunting, and the dinner was ready. As they were sitting at the table and eating, they asked, What news is there? said Benjamin. Don't you know anything? No, they answered. He continued, You have been in the forest, and I have stayed at home, and yet I know more than you do. Well, tell us then, they cried. He answered, But promise me that the first maiden who meets us shall not be killed. Yes, they all cried. She shall have mercy, only do tell us. Then said he, Our sister is here. And he lifted up the tub, and the king's daughter came forth in her royal garments with a golden star on her forehead, and she was beautiful, delicate and fair. Then they were all rejoiced, and fell on her neck, and kissed and loved her with all their hearts. Now she stayed at home with Benjamin, and helped him with the work. The eleven went into the forest and caught game, and deer and birds and wood pigeons, that they might have food, and the little sister and Benjamin took care to make it ready for them. She thought for the wood for cooking, and herbs for vegetables, and put the pans on the fire, so that the dinner was always ready when the eleven came. She likewise kept order in the little house, and put beautifully white clean coverings on the little beds, and the brothers were always contented and lived in great harmony with her. Once on a time, the two at home had prepared a beautiful entertainment, and when they were all together, they sat down and ate and drank and were full of gladness. There was, however, a little garden belonging to the bewitched house, wherein stood twelve lily flowers, which are likewise called students. She wished to give her brothers pleasure and plucked the twelve flowers and thought she would present each brother with one while at dinner. But at the self same moment that she plucked the flowers, the twelve brothers were changed into twelve ravens and flew away over the forest, and the house and garden vanished likewise. And now the poor maiden was alone in the wild forest, and when she looked around, an old woman was standing near her who said, My child, what hast thou done? Why didst thou not leave the twelve white flowers growing? They were thy brothers, who are now forevermore changed into ravens. The maiden said, weeping, Is there no way of delivering them? No, said the woman, There is but one in the whole world, 
and that is so hard that thou wilt not deliver them by it. For thou must be dumb for seven years, and mayst not speak or laugh, and if thou speakest one single word, and only an hour of the seven years is wanting, all is in vain, and thy brothers will be killed by the one word. Then said the maiden in her heart, I know with certainty that I shall set my brothers free, and went and thought a high tree, and seated herself in it, and span, and neither spoke nor laughed. Now it so happened that a king was hunting in the forest, who had a great greyhound which ran to the tree on which the maiden was sitting, and sprang about it, whining and barking at her. Then the king came by, and saw the beautiful king's daughter with the golden star on her brow, and was so charmed with her beauty, that he called to ask her if she would be his wife. She made no answer, but nodded a little with her head. So he climbed up the tree himself, carried her down, placed her on his horse, and bore her home. Then the wedding was solemnized with great magnificence and rejoicing, but the bride neither spoke nor smiled. When they had lived happily together for a few years, the king's mother, who was a wicked woman, began to slander the young queen, and said to the king, This is a common beggar girl whom thou hast brought back with thee. Who knows what impious tricks she practices secretly? Even if she be dumb and not able to speak, she still might laugh for once. But those who do not laugh have bad consciences. At first the king would not believe it, but the old woman urged this so long and accused her of so many evil things that at last the king let himself be persuaded and sentenced her to death. And now a great fire was lighted in the courtyard in which she was to be burned, and the king stood above the window and looked on with tearful eyes, because he still loved her so much. And when she was bound fast to the stake, and the fire was licking at her cloth with its red tongue, the last instant of the seven years expired. Then a whirring sound was heard in the air, and twelve ravens came flying towards the place, and sank downwards, and when they touched the earth, they were her twelve brothers whom she had delivered. They tore the fire asunder, extinguished the flames, set their dear sister free, and kissed and embraced her. And now, as she dared to open her mouth and speak, she told the king why she had been dumb and had never laughed. The king rejoiced when he heard that she was innocent, and they all lived in great unity until their death. The wicked stepmother was taken before the judge and put into a barrel filled with boiling oil and venomous snakes, and died an evil death. End of story 9 Story 10 of Household Tales Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Pack of Ragamuffins The cock once said to the hen, It is now the time when our nuts are ripe, so let us go to the hill together and for once eat our fill before the squirrel takes them all away. Yes, replied the hen, come, we will have some pleasure together. Then they went away to the hill, and as it was a bright day, they stayed till evening. Now I do not know whether it was that they had eaten till they were too fat, or whether they had become proud, but they would not go home on foot, and the cock had to build a little carriage of nutshells. When it was ready, the little hen seated herself in it, and said to the cock, Thou canst just harness thyself to it. I like that, said the cock. I would rather go home on foot than let myself be harnessed to it. No, that is not our bargain. I do not mind being coachman and sitting on the box, but drag it myself, I will not. As they were thus disputing, a duck quacked to them, You thieving folks! Who bade you go to my nut hill? Well, you shall suffer for it, and ran with open beak at the cock. But the cock also was not idle, 
and fell boldly on the duck, and at last wounded her so with his spurs that she also begged for mercy and willingly let herself be harnessed to the carriage as a punishment. The little cock now seated himself on the box and was coachman, and thereupon they went off in a gallop with, Duck, go as fast as thou canst. When they had driven a part of the way, they met two foot passengers, a pin and a needle. They cried, Stop, stop, and said that it would soon be as dark as pitch, and then they could not go a step further, and that it was so dirty on the road, and asked if they could not get into the carriage for a while. They had been at the tailor's public house by the gate, and had stayed too long over the beer. As they were thin people, who did not take up much room, the cock let them both get in, but they had to promise him and his little hen not to step on their feet. Late in the evening they came to an inn, and as they did not like to go further by night, and as the duck also was not strong on her feet and fell from one side to the other, they went in. The host at first made many objections. His house was already full. Besides, he thought they could not be very distinguished persons. But at last, as they made pleasant speeches and told him that he should have the egg which the little hen has laid on the way and should likewise keep the duck, which laid one every day, he at length said that they might stay the night. And now they had themselves well served, and feasted and rioted. Early in the morning, when day was breaking, and everyone was asleep, the cock awoke the hen, brought the egg, pecked it open, and they ate it together, but they threw the shell on the hearth. Then they went to the needle, which was still asleep, took it by the head, and stuck it into the cushion of the landlord's chair, and put the pin in his towel, and at the last, without more ado, they flew away over the heath. The duck, who liked to sleep in the open air and had stayed in the yard, heard them going away, made herself merry, and found a stream, down which she swam, which was a much quicker way of traveling than being harnessed to a carriage. The host did not get out of bed for two hours after this. He washed himself and wanted to dry himself. Then the pin went over his face and made a red streak from one ear to the other. After this, he went into the kitchen and wanted to light a pipe, but when he came to the hearth, the eggshell darted into his eyes. This morning everything attacks my head, said he, and angrily sat down on his grandfather's chair. But he quickly started up again and cried, Woe is me, for the needle had pricked him still worse than the pin, and not in the head. Now he was thoroughly angry, and suspected the guests who had come so late the night before. And when he went and looked about for them, they were gone. Then he made a vow to take no more ragamuffins into his house, for they consume much, pay for nothing, and play mischievous tricks into the bargain by way of gratitude. End of story 10